into the uh, JavaScript portion of this. So what we're going to do now is I'm just going to kind of go through a few slides and introduce some of the concepts of JavaScript. Um, just a few bits and pieces to give you an idea of why we're doing or why I'm doing a full stack JavaScript uh, boot camp curriculum and what you can do with JavaScript. When we're done with this portion, I'm going to show you a little bit of live code too. Uh, our, our demo code that you can that you can kind of follow along with and I'll explain step by step and that way you'll also get an idea of how exactly I teach and what you might expect um, if you were to be accepted to Claim Academy and pursue this. So we'll start with just generally what is programming right so forget about JavaScript just for a second there's all kinds of programming languages C Sharp, Java, Claim's been involved with a lot of these um, these technologies for the last five, six years now. Uh, and so they've always taught JavaScript, but this, this is one of the times when we're going to actually focus and go really, really in-depth with JavaScript. But all of those are just programming languages. And I really like this quote from one of my favorite JavaScript books, and it's right there on page one, right? So a lot of times, and boot camps do the same thing, but a lot of times you go to these places and they say, hey, everyone should learn to code and, and all this. And to me, this quote always makes me chuckle because it sort of says the opposite. Like on page one of this book, it sort of almost discourages you from coding, right? It, it says straight up, programming is fundamentally tedious and frustrating. But you know what? So is getting good at anything, right? Whether it's getting a real estate license. I don't know for sure, but I'm, there's probably a lot of books and things you got to read through to understand all of the different laws and, and permits and licenses and how everything works and all of the, the games they play with mortgage rates and this rate and closing costs. I'm just using that as an example. I mean, whatever, plumbing, take your pick, you know. Uh, anytime you're trying to learn something and learn it really well, it's probably going to have times when it is fundamentally tedious and frustrating. So take this quote with a grain of salt. Um, and I've um, transitioned into this by giving my own interpretation of what programming is based on my experiences. And uh, I've, I've put, pulled this together from a few different sources, you know, here and there over the years. But to really say what is programming, we take words and characters that we as humans understand and then we, we enter that into, in, into the computer, into some sort of a text editor. And when we run these programs, whether it's like JavaScript in the browser or, you know, it's Java or any, any other programming languages, when those are run, there's essentially a compilation interpretation process where our words and phrases are parsed or read by the computer and eventually you may have heard this before it all sort of goes down to ones and zeros right it all becomes binary at the end of the day i thought we would actually sort of even take a step back we mentioned javascript we mentioned programming let's take it just a step one more step above that talk about how computers work so we can really start to understand what what did i mean when i say that we take human words and characters and translate them into ones and zeros. Why? Why do we do that? So you probably already know this, but computers run on electricity. Electricity can have two states, either on or off. And with that said, you can already start to see why we say computers are all just ones and zeros. What we're really doing is we're directing the computer to turn switches or circuits, or gates, whatever you want to call them, under the hood, on and off, different states. Uh, so, for example, we could take those on and off sequences, if you will, and let's pretend they're porch lights. So, like Halloween time, there's one porch light. We can turn it on or off. If it's on, come trick or treat. If it's off, go away. If we had two porch lights, we can communicate four messages. Three porch lights, eight messages. So, it's kind of a weird analogy, but uh, this is done by a gentleman named Todd McLeod, an instructor out in California. And when he kind of explained it to me in those terms, I finally sort started to grasp what does it mean that computers are ones and zeros? Exactly that. We are just turning, if you will, porch lights on and off inside of the computer. The more porch lights that we have, the more messages we can communicate. So this was, you know, we were playing around Todd's coding scheme, right? So 
this is how this is the the fundamentals of okay if all of the switch if there's if our computer has three switches inside of it and we turn all of them off we can decide hey that represents the letter a if one of them is on that third one is on that's the letter b so on and so forth so you start to see how computers really communicate under the hood and why we say it's all binary and all ones and zeros Different programming languages set up different coding schemes. So when we're inside a certain programming environment, we type our human-friendly words and characters, and those are eventually compiled down to sequences of ones and zeros. And depending on which programming language or where we are and what we're doing, what the context is, it's going to mean different things. And that is where we get the term binary digits or bits. By the way, See that power symbol in the top right? That's supposed to be uh, a representation of ones and zeros. So that power logo kind of communicates a message right there. Computers are ones and zeros, binary digits or bits. And then that's where we hear, oh, you know, Charter advertises they have 200 megabit internet, so on and so forth. And these are approximations. Uh, for example, instead of 1,000, it's usually 1024. But no matter, I'm not going to drill you with a bunch of math or anything like that. So now we have some fundamental understanding of how computers work. It's really just sequences of, of ones and zeros in terms of turning things on and off in different patterns. Bit of trivia here. This was uh, one of the first computers. I think it was called ENIAC. 16,000 circuits. So this was back, I believe, in like the late 50s. So folks would just program computers by punching little holes in cards uh, this was actually a little bit after that, and even before then, they were just unplugging and turning things on and off. So that's what happens under the hood. When you press a letter on your keyboard, it's activating certain sequences of ones and zeros, and that ends up generating, for example, the letter A. Uh, one other bit of trivia. These computers literally had like these light bulbs on top of them, right? You may have heard of the term debugging. Well, these lights would actually attract moths and bugs. They would, they would uh, get caught up in, in these bulbs. And so literally somebody would have to, your, your program would break. It would stop functioning. So you would have to unscrew one of those and scrape out the bug guts and put that back on. That's the term debugging. So there's how computers work. We mentioned already um, about how programming works. Now let's get back into JavaScript. So as I was saying, we use words and characters understood by humans, and that's we're encoding that. We're writing programs. When they're run, it all turns into ones and zeros underneath it. Thankfully, we don't need to care about those ones and zeros, but I wanted you to have some idea of how this sort of works under the hood. What the heck is JavaScript? JavaScript uh, was created in the mid-90s by a gentleman uh, named Brendan Eich, or Eek, I'm not sure how you say that. Uh, there was a company called Netscape, and um, they wanted a way, and we had HTML and CSS, which we'll mention again in a little bit, but uh, they needed some way to make the pages more uh, interactive. So it was actually originally called LiveScript, and then just because of the huge popularity of Java at the time, it was sort of a marketing decision to switch it to JavaScript. Unfortunately, that creates some confusion. Uh, in fact, when I, I took a JavaScript class a few years ago, uh, actually, I thought I was taking a JavaScript class. Turned out it was a Java class. So actually, my programming roots, when I really got serious about it, uh, was a, a Java class. So that's uh, that's a big part of what Claim Academy does. But that's actually where I, I started programming Java. But eventually, obviously, I went to JavaScript. The point is, there is no direct association between Java and JavaScript. It's often said that Java is to JavaScript as ham is to hammock. Yeah, they're both programming languages, Java and JavaScript, and they do look a little bit the same just by design, but other than that, there's no connection between the two. I didn't know that. I took a Java class thinking it was, that was my first experience of programming, but, but that's okay. So why do we choose JavaScript? Why are we doing this full stack uh, program? Well, JavaScript is... Be relatively beginner friendly uh you know of course this is a little bit subjective what i'm saying i hope the java instructors don't get mad at me but 
I'm going to go out on a limb, having taken Java and, and looked at other programming languages, and say JavaScript is maybe a little bit more beginner-friendly. Uh, it's very, very loose. Uh, there's not a lot of strict rules. That's a good thing and a bad thing, right? So because JavaScript is so loose and you can write it in so many different ways, uh, we really need to be wary of uh, of bad coding practices and that's where that's where my job comes and that's where our mentor's job comes in is to say yeah you could write it this way and technically it does work but this is probably going to be better and here's why and that way when professional software engineers look at your code they're going to say oh wow okay so this person knows their javascript they know some of the best practices uh, JavaScript rules web development because it's the only programming language that's built into every single web browser by default. I mean, there may be some exception. Let's say every non-insane web browser by default, right? And um, Stack Overflow, if you don't know what that is, that's a, a common Q&A forum or community where people just, uh, where all you, where people go to learn and ask Q&A about just all kinds of programming related things. Uh, but you know, following some of these trends on these communities gives you an idea of, you know, what languages are, are sort of uh, most talked about. And JavaScript is definitely up there. And we'll mention what GitHub here is also, uh, also in a little bit. But GitHub is sort of like social media for developers. And it's a way for us to collaborate and share code. And it's JavaScript is one of the most tagged languages on GitHub. You may hear the term ECMAScript, or if you're Googling around. So I wanted to take just a second to clear that up. So in 2015, actually June of 2015, JavaScript got a major overhaul. And there's sort of this governing body, if you will, not, not part of the government or anything, but sort of just a, a committee, if you will, uh, called ECMAScript. And there was a few other scripting languages that they would work with previously, but those are kind of fallen by the wayside. Uh, so ECMAScript and JavaScript are essentially the same thing. Usually when we say ECMAScript, we're referring to the more modern JavaScript that was released in June of 2015. And since that time, every one to two years, nothing as major as what happened in 2015, but there's there's been you know new updates and things. And that's also where Claim Academy and myself and mentors come in, right? If you're Googling around for stuff on JavaScript, you, you never really, there's so many ways to do it, and, and it's been around for so long. You never really know, is this really how I'm supposed to do this? Is this really the most modern approach? Um, and, and that's where we come in and, and help you out with that type of stuff. Uh, so we're going to focus on, uh, well, this is what I say in my class. I guess I, I just copied that text there. We will focus on, so yeah, if, um, if you're accepted to Claim Academy and everything and things work out and you get serious about this, we will be learning to write JavaScript with some of the newest features of the language so that when software engineers take a look at your work, they, they can see that, you know, wh where, where you're coming from and that you know the modern features. So a little bit more about JavaScript and some of the terminology. We're just going to introduce variables, primitives, expressions, and statements. So when we're interacting with a computer, we need to create pieces of data, whether that's a word, a number, uh, or something more complicated than that. It all needs, it's all individual pieces of data. And we need to store that in memory for future access. But how do we access just these abstract pieces of data from memory, we have to create some references. And that's what we mean when we say creating a variable. A variable is nothing more than a reference or a binding to a piece of data in memory. So we have a couple of different types of data that we work with in JavaScript. We have primitives, which are those simple things, such as numbers and strings, uh, booleans, which just mean true or false, or on or off, if you will. Uh, and they all just hold kind of one discrete piece of data. So strings, and we're gonna see some code examples here very shortly, but strings, you'll notice that they always have quotation marks around them. It's just like dialogue in a book. Uh, you know, you put quotations mark to quotation marks around it to to uh, show that this is what some character is actually saying word for word. That's how strings work in JavaScript. We're telling JavaScript, hey, this stuff in quotation marks, 
Uh, yeah, you don't need to overthink it. Or just, just literally just keep it exactly how it is. Don't try to do anything with this. Uh, numbers uh, are, they don't, they're not wrapped in quotation marks. If I took a number and put quotation marks around it, it would be a string. So a number is just, well, numbers, one, two, three, four, three point one four, whatever it is. One thing you should know about JavaScript it doesn't really differentiate between integers or whole numbers and floating point numbers or decimals. So that's something that if you've ever looked at other programming languages um, is a little bit different about JavaScript. And then I mentioned Booleans are either true or false. And Booleans, again, are not in quotation marks. The takeaway is that Anytime something is wrapped in those quotation marks, it is just word for word, we call that a string. If it's a number, well, it's a number, it doesn't matter if it's decimals, integers. And if it's true or false, but no quotation marks, it means it's, it's, it's a Boolean. It's like on or off, true or false. So let's take a look at how we actually create and instantiate these variables. They sound like fancy words, but again, creating means that we are telling JavaScript, hey, uh, I need to reserve some space and memory. I'm going to create a variable. And then instantiating just means, um, hey, you know that spot in memory? Um, yeah, I want you to connect that to this piece of data. That's what instantiating means. And the assignment operator, that's an equal sign. This is what that, that looks like here. Right there at the bottom, you see const x equals blue. So take a second and think about what type of data is blue? What type of data is blue? So we see the quotation marks around it, so we know that it should be a string. So uh, we can use the keyword const. That's the part that says, hey, JavaScript, I want to reserve some space in memory. And the, the x right next to it, that is just a made up uh, character x. It could be really called anything at all. Uh, but we just make up a name. So we could have called this color, we could have called it Mickey Mouse, whatever it is. We just need to name that space in memory. Here's that fancy assignment operator, just an equal sign. And then here's a piece of data. So what ends up happening in this, in this statement is JavaScript creates a string called blue. It assigns it to in, into memory. That spot in memory is under the variable x. And then the const is what kind of gets everything uh, going here by letting JavaScript know, hey, we need to create a space in memory and create this binding. That string blue needs to be connected to this variable x, this spot in memory. Uh, and then I put a little extra note in here about what happens if, we're, if we stop using some pieces of data. Do we run out of memory? Yeah, you could run out of memory, but JavaScript manages our memory for us. So if we're no longer using pieces of data, JavaScript comes along and has a garbage collector, is actually the technical term, and it removes it from memory. So we don't have to worry about any of that. We just use the keyword const. There's also a keyword let. Uh, so const or let, and we won't get into the differences with that just yet at least. But the key is this is one of the fundamental aspects of any programming. Create some data, in this case a string, create a spot in memory, and assign that data to that spot in memory. So if you can follow this, then you, you're already starting to follow programming. Expressions versus statements. So expressions, this is a quote from Dan Abramov, who's, a, a, who's big in the JavaScript community. Uh, expressions are questions that JavaScript can answer. JavaScript answers expressions the only way it knows how with value. So that's sort of a, a fancy way of saying that what is an expression? An expression is anything that creates a value. For example, 2 plus 2, that's an expression. It creates the value 4. So we start taking these expressions and we create, uh, we create form statements by using operators and keywords. So for example, in this case, our expression would be hello because it just, when we put that in quotes, it just creates the value hello or the data hello. We combine that with our assignment operator and the keyword const. Remember what const means? Const is one of the keywords we use to tell JavaScript we want to reserve some space in memory. And then uh, from there, we, we name that spot in memory. So this is a complete JavaScript statement. And most of the time, we end those with semicolons. Uh, and then this is just an individual expression because it represents a value. Uh, down here, we'll get into this a little bit more, but down here, we have this thing in JavaScript called the console, 
And we use dot notation to kind of pick out pieces of functionality that we can use with console, connect the two. One of those is log, and this is just going to log something to the screen. So there you go. You've just gotten a, a brief sample or a brief taste of how we create variables, how we work with data. You also learned fundamentally under the hood, all of these programming languages take human words and characters and sort of compile them down to ones and zeros. And, and we go into that a little bit more in the formal class. I'm just trying to work within uh, a few time constraints here and video bandwidth, if you will. Uh, let's take a quick look at the keyword let before we look at some real program, uh, some real code rather. So JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. And at this point, I will tell you that const is something uh, that you might think it stands for constant, and that's kind of sort of true. And that's one of the first kind of tricky things we go over in our class. But for right now, generally speaking, we do use const like I just showed you. But if I wanted to create a variable and have it reference a string, remember this is an expression, this is an assignment operator, this is the name for some spot in memory, and this is the keyword that reserves that spot in memory. Uh, and then, like I said, normally we have a semicolon after these things. So if I wanted to all of a sudden just say, hey, you know what, blue, uh, the string blue, yeah, I'm done with you. We're, we're breaking up. Okay, no, it's over. It's over, blue. We're breaking up. It's over. I'm going to bind 23. Now, uh, now X is bound to the number 23. And blue, guess what happens to all blue? Remember we talked about memory management? Yeah, all blue goes to the garbage can, garbage collector. So this shows you an example of a couple of examples. We can create variables with the keyword const. We can also create a variable with the keyword let. So we just have to sort of figure out, hey, is this a value that we're going to be changing around and reassigning to different types? Are we going to use the equal sign again with this value? If so, we use the keyword let. Otherwise, we usually use the keyword const. So we'll get into some of the next steps here, but at this juncture, um, I wanted to show you actually a little bit of real code. Actually, even before that, I kind of forgot about this as part of my JavaScript sales pitch. Like, why do you want to learn JavaScript besides just creating some variables? What else can you do with it? Well, one of the, uh, the hottest trends, I guess you could say, and I, I hate to use the word trend because it's not just like, you know, come and go type of thing, but React. React is really hot for a lot of front-end JavaScript jobs, stuff where we build user interfaces, right? Stuff that, uh, that well, users are going to use. For example, anything, a lot of things we use in the web, when we click a button, we expect certain actions to occur. We expect to see certain pieces of data come up and things like that when we're logging into applications. And a lot of those are powered by libraries such as React, or maybe you may have heard of Vue or Angular. Uh, but React is the one that we focus on teaching. But here's the thing, with Claim Academy, um, especially with the curriculum that, that, uh, that I'm teaching for the JavaScript side, I really avoid trying to say, hey, we are going to learn React. Yeah, we need to learn one of these. But even before that, we sort of have a little transitionary period where we learn general concepts so that even if you do learn React, you not, not only know some React, but you know the foundational concepts. And that allows you to say, if you go to a job and they say, oh, we don't use React here, we use Angular. You don't have to worry about it. You're like, yeah, that's okay. I really understand React, but I also understand some of the core concepts of these types of libraries. So give me a week or two and I will be back ready to rumble with Angular. Or hopefully the company will guide you in that. But the point is, it's not like, oh, no, I had learned React. I can't, you know, apply for an Angular job. Of course you can. Of course you can. Again, the key is that in our curriculum, we want to teach you the foundational concepts of what sort of binds all of these different uh, flavors, if you will, of, of these JavaScript libraries. So there's React, and this helps us build uh, user interfaces for, for web applications, things that we do. Not only that, though, let's say we click a login button. Well, we'll learn more about this in the class, but uh, when we click a login button, then we go from the browser, from the browser over to a server. Like there's a server somewhere at some company that receives our username and password in a secure fashion. And then it checks its 
records or its database to see, hey, did they match up the stuff correctly? Should we let them in? So all of that type of logic is done server side. Uh, and then the server will send back a response and say, hey, you're okay. Hey, browser, um, yeah, everything's okay here. Uh, here is their actual login page. Or it'll say, uh, yeah, browser, uh, I'm the server. And I'm giving you a response here, and my response is that, yeah, this is unauthorized. So, yeah, th th this, is, this is what we're going to show the user, a big not authorized uh, symbol or whatever. Uh, anyway, that all happens on the server, and that's where we get into back-end development. In fact, I guess I should have mentioned, what does that term full stack really mean? Full stack means you can handle the stuff I just showed you, like user interfaces with React, but you can also take care of what happens on the server. And how do you do that with JavaScript? That's what Node.js does. And we pick up on some of that in the, uh, in the in sort of the second half of our bootcamp curriculum. Once we've learned, once we've nailed down a lot of JavaScript fundamentals, we take our same core concepts again, and we learn how to apply them in a server environment. What else can you do with JavaScript? A couple of more things here. Since you know React, there's a couple other things like native script and stuff like that, but you can kind of tell here by the screen, uh, React Native actually allows us to write React code, and then we can deploy Android and iOS projects just with using JavaScript. So let's keep track of it here. We've talked about JavaScript being used as a fundamental programming language. We've talked about JavaScript being used in the browser with user interfaces with something like React.js. We see now React Native allows us to build mobile phone apps uh, with JavaScript. And we saw that we can also use JavaScript on the server. Just to give you a hint, there's really not any other languages that can, that can do that. We're not finished yet. We've got one more. Uh, Electron. Build cross-platform desktop apps. Right? So now we're talking about, like, I'm here on Mac OS, and I'm in the Zoom uh, mode here. Let me get out of that for a second. If I scroll down here, it'll pop up all of these apps. Well, for example, one of the apps I use is Slack. Uh, and then this is VS Code. We're going to take a look at that in a little bit. But a lot of these apps... Uh, I can't say for sure. I know Slack used to be. I think they had a, re a different rewrite now. But Slack at least used to be an Electron app. That means it was written with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So again, you can take these fundamental core things that we would learn at Claim Academy, and you can do essentially everything. Now, that's not saying that JavaScript is the end-all, be-all, magical, best, absolute tool. But it is kind of like a Swiss army knife, right? Like in a pinch, you can use that Swiss army knife for a lot of stuff. Um, and then, you know, for more specialized needs, of course, you may look at, you know, other options that are available. But that's really cool uh, to me that you can learn JavaScript and you at least have some understanding and some capability in desktop, in browser, uh, in mobile devices, and on the server. And really, like I said, no other programming language can make that brash of a claim. All right, so now we're going to take a look at little uh, take a look at a little bit of code. So usually when we use computers, we are used to the point and click interface and the GUIs, a graphical user interface if you will, and that's all fine and good, but as professional developers and software engineers, we want to get an idea of how to work in the terminal. We can work more quickly. There are certain tasks that we just can't do outside of the terminal um, and for any a number of reasons so part of what we learn in uh, our curriculum is how to do just that we spend the first part of the boot camp actually getting familiar with some of the terminal commands understanding how to uh, how to work how to do some of the same things that we've pointed and clicked with our mouse mice mouse for so long mouses uh, and learning how to do those from the terminal so this is what I'm using right now is a terminal emulator on Mac called iTerm I term two technically, uh, but no matter. Let me show you co the the code for an app. Let me actually show you the app itself. So I am going to quickly shut down this other process that I have here, and we'll exit out of that one. Okay, and then again, I'll have to explain some of these details. I'm going to fire up a web server right now. So I'm sort of simulating the server. Uh, process right here on my local computer and this is how we want to test our basic websites so this is a really basic app 
that I just put together. Um, and when I hit go, it reaches out to the Unsplash gallery and brings back uh, just an image from there, right? It's very, very simple by design. Um, you know, I didn't even center this stuff out or anything like that. I actually just sort of built this more like for a simple uh, mobile thing. But I wanted to keep the code as, as clean and simple as possible. And uh, this is one of those things where you just build uh, something with some basic functionality and then you start extending on it. So this is something that we might um, play around with in the class. So if I come in here and I switch this to car... Uh, then it'll reach out to Unsplash and it'll bring back some cars. And, of course, we could set up functionality to where this has, like, a nice loader that when it's reaching out for the data. Uh, we can do some more formatting for the larger screens. But nevertheless, let me just give you a glimpse as to how something like this might work. And let me show you what all is in, in our uh, project here. So I'm inside of VS Code, which is a text editor. And I'm going to zoom in here so you can see this list a little bit. So there's a lot of other files that, that we talk about in the class. But the foundation of anything on the web is HTML. So here's a little bit of HTML that I wrote for that app. And you, you saw from, uh, from the earlier display that it just had like a little header. It has a link back to Unsplash here. Uh, and then it has a simple form with a go button. And right here inside of these main tags... That's where the uh, that's where the picture loads, right? And right now it's blank. And what's going to happen is I've set up this template down here, which we don't see on the screen. But uh, the JavaScript we're going to look at is going to reach out to Unsplash and then put our picture inside of the main tag. So I don't want to focus too much on the HTML because this is about more about JavaScript. So let me show you the JavaScript portion of it. Oh, and I guess while I'm at it, yeah, there's a little bit of styling going on. So where we've centered some of the text and added some colors and sizing. So again, not a lot of code here, but there is some CSS or cascading style sheets. And I cover all that also, of course, in the, uh, in the class. Let me make this a little bit bigger here. I'm going to increase my font size. Okay, that should make it a little bit more a little bit more readable. Let's open that back up. All right, much better. So you already know uh, an idea, have an idea of what this code is doing up here, right? Remember that const keyword? Well, I'm creating some space in memory, giving it some names. What I'm doing here is using uh, is accessing things in the browser, right? So if I was to actually take another look at the HTML, I can see here that there is an input field, right? And if I want to grab that input field from the page, this is how I do it right here. I uh, reached into the document and I use the query selector method and I say, hey, I want to grab an input. So I'm just telling the browser, I want to grab that input field. I also want these main, this main area here and I want the template area that's down here. So I can use JavaScript to pull that information in and wrap it up in these variables. Now this here is just some commenting that sort of describes the function, so we won't worry too much about that. But this next part is a modern JavaScript function written in arrow syntax. So this first part looks the same. We're creating uh, some space and memory. And in this function here, what it's doing is it is receiving uh, some information. In this case, this is just something that I called search val. We can see here that's a string. What that's going to represent is the value that I typed in to the input. That's just a made up name, search val. I could have called it anything, could have called it Mickey Mouse. And the way that the, the image is actually loaded from Unsplash is if we looked on their website, they would tell us that we can use this URL. If I do that, then Unsplash says, hey, if you send us that, oops, if you send us that, then we are going to load an image of a cat here. Looks like things are running a little bit slow for Unsplash today. We noticed that in our app, but trust me, it is trying to load, <laughs> there we go, an image of a cat, right? So that's just using Unsplash, that if we send a URL with some terms after it, then it'll load that uh, as a random uh, image. So we're using JavaScript to sort of put that together for us. We take that search value. So if I talk, type in dog, type in cat, whatever it is, um, it will 
basically build out this URL with those terms over here. And I've got this set up so that I can actually type in like dog, space, cat, space, camel, any of those, and this thing will still work. But the point of it is it builds out this URL, and that's it. This is this entire function. That's it right there. That's a JavaScript function right there. Takes in some type of a string and builds out that URL, okay? Uh, next, we have something that builds out the actual markup that we need to show that picture. So, for example, uh, for example, here uh, in our uh, markup or HTML, we can see we have this template tag, and it's got this figure here. So, it turns out the figure tag is what we use uh, to show images. And so coming in here, we can take a look at uh, this code right here. It says, hey, go into that template. Remember that template that we grabbed earlier? I mentioned that we were grabbing the template right up here on line three. We'll go into that template and grab its content and clone it. So this is doing, just doing a little bit more here, but essentially it's just making an entire copy of all of this, uh, all of this HTML. And then it's saying, hey, uh, go in here and grab these, this uh, image tag and switch its source. For the source, I want you to use that URL. Now we saw that we put that URL in the browser, it brings back an image. So we're going to use that same technique to dump it into the image source. Uh, we're not doing anything with the alt tag in this particular instance. Uh, that builds out all of the markup necessary. Um, and that's it. These are our functions. We only have two functions. One of them builds out the unsplash URL once it receives some strings or some word search terms. And the other one takes that URL, grabs this markup, and inserts that URL into the source here. After that, we need to grab our form, and we just need to listen. We just need to hang around and listen until there's a submit event. That means when this go button is clicked, this is a submit button attached to this form. When we have that submit event, we want to grab that event, that submit event that's in the browser, and we want to stop the browser from trying to do anything. We want to take over. So you're going to see this code quite a bit with form submissions, but it grabs that event, prevents the default behavior of the browser. From there, we're going to clear out anything that's inside of the main tags, like if we had an image that we already had in there. And then we're going to say, grab that main and append child. That essentially just means put some stuff in here. What do we want to put in there? Well, we want to grab the value that the user typed into the search field. We're going to build out the image URL up here. We want to pass that URL into our figure to create all of this markup, and then we dump that into the main tag. So if we go back to our app and have a look, uh, let's see, right here, I'm going to look inside of our developer tools, which you can open up with Command Shift, or Command Option I on Mac and Control Shift I on Windows. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And let's take a look at what the finished code looks like here. Here's that main tag. Now remember, it starts off empty. And what does the JavaScript actually do? It dumps all of this stuff in here. Again, that was not inside of the main tag, but JavaScript wrote all this for us created this, here we go, when I typed in car right here, see that car? That was put together and all put into the main tag. And you can see, not a lot of code to do that, right? And this was a very quick explanation. I wanna make it clear that we would really be breaking things down a lot more and you'd already know a lot of these underlying concepts. So this is just to give you a quick taste of what we can do with JavaScript within the browser. And that's really just scratching the surface now, isn't it, right? So from there, uh, we learn about React, we learn about Node, databases, all of that type of stuff. So with all that being said, I guess in closing, uh, in closing here, I thank you very much for your time. Definitely take the next step, sign up, fill out the questionnaire, um, and you know go through the process, see if, if, if it works out to be a good fit. Um, and yeah, that's, that's actually, as an instructor, that's one of the things that I, that one of the reasons that drew me to claim academy is because uh they really do vet the students and um they you know the the students that uh, that i've dealt with so far they're they're dedicated they're focused they're putting in the time on task so again as an instructor 
If you do end up in my full stack JavaScript curriculum, I'm going to take very good care of you. Uh, but I always tell my students, I'm going to guide you, but you got to put the time on task. Programming is like riding a bike. You can't just watch me ride the bike. Okay, you've got to go and actually get on the bike and ride it, and that's how you learn. But I am always there to continue to support and reciprocate your efforts. Thank you, and thank you.